I'm going to move us on to the next section. And this is looking at our early Unitarian forebearers. And I'm going to only talk about two of them today. And in future sessions, when we go through some of the, the uh, fine tuning, I'll get into more detail with more and more people. But in the early movements of Unitarianism, the big name was William Ellery Channing. Now, this is around plus or minus 1800. Um, and William Ellery Channing was a congregational minister, preacher. Uh, he was in New England, Boston area, and was arguably one of the most well-known preachers in the country. He wasn't a Unitarian. He was a congregationalist preacher. And as time is going on, this is someone that gets covered in the papers. People are reading his sermons in the newspapers at the time. And he's preaching to huge audiences. Um, and one day he starts preaching about salvation through character. That we are saved by growing the character of our souls. Um, and this causes a stir. And there's a lot of back and forth in the papers about his statements. And papers are increasingly saying that he is um, succumbing to the Unitarian heresy, that we're not saved through God's actions, but our own. And this goes on back and forth for a while. And then finally he says, you know what? Yeah, I am a Unitarian. And he takes a third of the congregational churches with him in New England, uh, almost overnight, not quite overnight, but, and then he starts going down the Eastern Seaboard preaching at places. And this is, um, all Souls in New York City comes out of this, for example, but he's going all the way down to Maryland preaching. And I'm not gonna go into his papers or the big sermons, um, but I wanna kind of talk about the shift in what happens in religious power in the America and in the States at this point, when your most prominent preacher, one of your most prominent preachers takes a third of the congregational churches with them. Uh, it creates a power dynamic. And all of a sudden, over 30 years, you have most of the New England courts, judges, et cetera, schools are run by Unitarians. And there was a big um, challenge around all of this because you had situations where churches that were congregational, at first, a bunch of people would leave them and the Unitarians would stay. And then there'd be fights in courts on who got to own the building. And well, the people that left the church no longer had standing and many of the judges in the courts were Unitarian. And all of a sudden a third of those churches buildings just became a new denomination. Um, and this was played out in Harvard, which is one of our seminaries um, and would shift the tenor of what happens later in the transcendentalist movement because all of a sudden the intellectuals, a huge swath of them are Unitarians. Uh, rather than the other denominations. Uh, so you have a split that becomes more of a split later between Congregationalists and UCC and, and UU. Uh, so Channing, the big theological bit with him is, is salvation through character. So what he's teaching in the, at the pulpit is that it is core to continuously grow and to live your values openly and honestly, your actions actually matter. Uh, it goes kind of hark harkens back to the early argument between faith and works and uh, from that's scriptural. And so now we are saying we're lifting it up and saying uh, faith without works is empty. Uh, he's using different language. He's talking about growing our individual souls and community. And a few years later, we're looking at Theodore Parker and he's in the same area. Um, he might be he might be almost the next generation afterwards, but Theodore Parker coming in next takes Channing's message of salvation through character and runs with it and preaches a message of the transient and the permanent. And his his message was he was still identifying as Christian, but he was sort of saying things in Christianity that there's some things that are permanent that are true always, and there's some things that are transient. And every generation and every culture 
needs to figure out what are the transient things that are shifting over time with new learning or new locations or, or um, new realities in the world. And if folks <clears throat> took issue with Channing, there was sort of a, a revolt with um, Parker. This was a bit too far. And uh, his colleagues uh, almost uh, defrocked him. And it was ugly because Parker was also another preacher who was wildly known. I mean, he was one of the prominent preachers at the time. And it was so contentious and painful that when they finally decided not to vote to um, excommunicate him or so from the, the denomination, they sat back and said, there was sort of a mindset that's going to come up in our next session with the bringing in the humanists that sets the beginning of we're not going to have a creed for our preachers. Because if, if we are about to excommunicate someone that we're so close with and have learned so much from, what are we doing? And maybe a creed, exact creed, is not uh, worthwhile for us as a faith movement. Excuse me. For Channing's preaching about salvation through character, how close do we contemporary views still live that theology? Thank you, Marsha. Yeah, I'm going to um, lift some of that up here because it's a, an interesting take. Um, tying in salvation through character and looking at the lack of creed today. Um, the eight, seven principles or eight principles are not belief statements, right? They're, and we don't require them, you're right, to for people to follow them, to join membership in a congregation. But at, not but, and they're written as covenantal promises we make to one another that we're aspiring to live into this reality. So it's not a dogma or principles, but it might be dogmatics. It might be how do we live our lives, not what you need to believe. But um, so, you know, we covenant to affirm and promote the inherent worth and dignity of every person. One might not believe every person's worthy or, or has dignity. Um, but the call is to live in a way that we try, we attempt to affirm and promote that as best we can. Um, but that's a tricky space. Our principles are not meant to be creeds. You're right. So the question is, what are we being, with salvation, what are we being saved from? And that's a different answer during Channing's time in the 1800s, where it's, there's still very much a, a uniform Christian belief of heaven. And today, it depends on what you're, because we're non-credal. That's, I mean, this is where this is, it's evolved. So some folks don't believe in heaven or hell. Um, and so salvation doesn't make a lot of sense in that sense. However, I think about like in Jewish tradition, the idea of mending a broken world. So it could be uh, salvation can be bringing wholeness into this world here. Uh, many in the Christian tradition, whether they believe in heaven or not, even if they don't, there's still a mindset of living to bring the kingdom of heaven here or the kingdom of heaven here on earth, paradise on earth. In Buddhism and, and Hinduism, for those that are coming from those perspectives, very much, it could be very similar. Salvation may not translate in the same way, but this constant moving from the spiritual side toward um, a deeper sense of awareness and mindfulness of the cycles of the soul or the, the not self, uh, or the Quaker idea of um, we're God's hands on earth, you know, that whole range. And so the, the perennial challenge for contemporary UUs is how do we translate language that makes sense within our personal belief system that still reaches back to what the words were meaning and how they evolved and changed. As Parker would have said, the transient and the permanent. Uh, I hope that helps.